Hi, welcome to the uh, first session of the second week of the Open Security Summit. Uh, we have a really, really cool uh, session today, which Petra is going to take the lead. I'm just a sidekick. I'm just helping out a little bit. Um, just uh, before we start, so the Open Security Summit is uh, an event that we're organizing, which is all about collaboration, about sharing. Um, you know, it's, it's very important that um, we, you know, we really sort of focus on, um, on, on sharing and, and learning. You know, that's the key objective for us here, for everybody here to have a great experience. Uh, we, we put a very big focus on respect and actually it's very timely given the stuff that's happening around the world. And we, you know, we you know, support all, all of this you know, movement. And I think we support basically the idea that, you know, uh, everybody should be respected and everybody should have a voice and and we really take it serious at the summit so you know let us know if you spot anything but so far it's been brilliant and great collaboration and um, finally little topic it's about openness so everything we do at the summit is open we're recording all these sessions so if you don't want to be uh, on video or on record you know just put, put something on your name and um, don't put your image uh, on the screen but apart from that you know if you can I, I highly encourage because you're going to meet a lot of great individuals it's great for your career um it's great for the collaboration uh but everything we want to do here is released uh and open source licenses creative commons uh or uh, open source and, and finally you know the, the the hashtag is oss 2020 so please retweet share your views uh the videos will be online a bit later you know share with your friends and, uh, and actually, we, we kind of relaxed the, sort of the rules um, to registration. So literally, you know, if, if you, you know, other friends or colleagues that want to join, you know, just come in, you know, register, you know, just say you sponsored or, you know, you're from one of the, um, you know, OWASP project or something like that. And then, you know, that's all cool. Uh, what we want is to have the maximum amount of talent participating in the, in the summit uh, as possible. And, um, and then for the ones who bought a ticket, it's brilliant, right? Because it helps to support the costs of running this thing. Cool, so Petra, over to you. Hello everyone. Um, well, let me first introduce myself to um, people that don't know me. Um, my name is Petra Vukumiric and I am currently working at Glasswall um, in their InfoSec team. Uh, I got my job as a productivity engineer. That's how I started in Glasswall. Um, I am currently, I'm a doctor by background, a medical doctor and I'm currently studying uh, information security and digital forensics, and hence how I changed careers and ended up in Glasgow, which has been a very, very exciting journey for me, which I'm still traveling on, so yay. Okay, so um, this session is about threat modeling. It's aimed at beginners, but it, will be, it can be interesting and very much fun for uh, you know, all the levels. Um, but I'm just going to start with a little introduction to what is actually threat modeling. So basically threat modeling is a process. Um, in DevSecOps, we like that process to be at the beginning. So when we're planning to do it, our, our application, that's when we should plan also threat modeling alongside one to another. Um, so basically it's a process which will help us identify any weak points um, any vulnerabilities to the application and kind of map a plan to get them. Um, so technically, if we have the vulnerabilities, the threats and the risks of that application, for example, then we already pretty much are very close to having a threat model. Now, in the process of creating a threat model, ask yourself strike questions, which I will talk about a bit later. And the best thing to do is when you start creating a threat model is to just start creating an attack tree or start creating a diagram, which I'll show you some cool online tools about that later. And technically to wrap it up, um, as Dennis always says, a threat model is basically a pen test on paper. So we're actually hacking, but we're just doing it on paper. We're writing it all down and drawing some cool diagrams. Um, so just to tell you what a threat model is, I'm just going to cover some infosec basics. So you probably all know what's a vulnerability. It's a flaw in architecture. It's a weakness. So as you all know, uh, a chain is strong as its weakest link. So it's important that we, you know, cover the vulnerabilities. Um, 
a threat is a vector or an agent that can potentially take advantage of that vulnerability. Now, we come to risk then. A risk is basically the combination of a threat agent or vector taking advantage of a vulnerability, and there we get a risk. And then in the process of creating this risk assessment, we have to determine the likelihood of impact, and then we get the risk level, and then we can decide whether we want to accept it or not. So as I said earlier, at the moment of launch, every safe application should already have a valid threat model. Um, even a lot of people advertise threat modeling per feature. So all the features, if they're added on later, they should have a new threat model. Um, and actually we advertise that the ones who instigate the threat model would be the developers. Because um, basically the developers, by creating an application, it's best that they don't actually own the risk related to that application. Um, it's you know, it's obviously something that's advertised that they delegate the risk to higher management who can then later um, accept that risk or decide to mitigate it. And that's why it's important that this is done at the beginning because you don't want to go back to mitigating risks and vulnerabilities at the end when the application is ready to launch. Now, in Glasswall, to facilitate this for the developer team, I have we have created a playbook which is a threat model and playbook. I want to show you that quickly. Um, I'm just going to click on it for a second. So basically, um, in Glasgow, we create a lot of playbooks and just to facilitate all the processes. And a playbook is a set of questions and tasks. So in this case, the developer starts triggers this playbook and starts asking themselves these questions and then starts creating these tasks in, uh, starts doing these tasks in JIRA. Now the developer can answer all of the questions if they know and do all of the tasks, but it can all be delegated to the InfoSec team uh, or the security champion within um, the developer's team. So this is just something that um, we, we like to do and makes it easier for the developer to kind of process that. So back to threat modeling. Um, as I said, actually, can I just, let me just add yeah. a quick comment on that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you go back to just to go back to Jira, um, the, the the use of Jira here is very important because we, uh, you know, this is this is how how you scale, right? One of the challenges that you have with threat models, for example, is that you generate tons of questions and there's a huge amount of, of follow-up that should be happening. And there's a huge amount of, in a way, sometimes vulnerabilities and, 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 and threats so that you need to be mapped, but also there's a huge amount of facts that need to be captured. Um, one of the problems I've seen with sometimes a lot of tools is that so on threat modeling is that they, they start by generating a whole pile of, um, of threats and risks uh, based on a structure. And actually I prefer to do the reverse. I prefer to first, really zoom in and understand as much as we can or as much it can be described of the application itself and then only add vulnerabilities and risks that are 100% relevant to that particular threat model, to that particular path that you, you're looking at. And this is the kind of stuff that it gets easier the more data you have because you, you don't have to ask the same question over and over again because you should already have it. And one of the, the, the challenges that you have with threat models is that you are asking lots of questions that don't have good answers, but that's actually very important, right? Like the fact that some of these questions don't have a good answer, in a way, it might even be a risk in itself, right? That might, might be a situation where you need to take into account because there's definitely a difference that if you do this with three teams, the more mature from a security and a development um, team, the easier there, some of these questions will be. Right. In fact, there's, there's, a, there's almost a case where a lot of these questions are already answered or already available before you start the thread model because a very good development team with very good engineering practices, very good DevOps practices, very good workflows, would already have all those answers. And when they don't, um, you know, all of these are places where the thread modeling process can add value. So if you look at these questions, right, you know, what are the users, the actors, what's the data elements, you know, what privilege they're going to have, what's the tech you're using, what security measures, what are the trust boundaries, you know, what's, you know, uh, the impact on exploitation. A lot of these things, right, are questions that you want to know. 
right? So what, the reason why we do this in JIRA is because, and I know it sounds insane until you experience it, right? Is that every one of these questions, we track it, right? And because every one of these questions, you know, needs an answer. And, and the problem is, where do you put it? And if you put it in a Word document or actually on a Confluence page, it will be out of date very quickly. So when you come back after a while, you don't have a, a scalable way to capture information. So I don't particularly care if you use Jira, you can use all sorts of other issues, but it has to be a graph. It has to be in a place where you can hyperlink the questions, you can hyperlink the answers, you can hyperlink the facts that you're discovering, and then the vulnerabilities and the risks that you're discovering. So Jira gives us that, but you know, there's other ways to do it. But, but you can see that it's, it's super important to have the attention to detail and the granularity that this has. And, and just for reference, the way this works is that we have a, we have a mini tool that we wrote um, in a, actually using a notebook, which actually I think is about to be triggered from Slack. I don't, I don't think that's wired yet, but we, we, we triggered it from, from a Jupyter notebook that takes a notebook like this and clones the notebook uh, into, for example, an action, or in this case, into a thread model. So, so, what, so the playbook that you see here is literally just the templates that we use when we do the thread model. And, and the objective is to have lots of these, and each of those are very specific to specific scenarios, because the questions you want to ask in a client server application is different from a cloud application, is different from an authorization, you know, uh, uh, sort of, let's say, one that is very focused on the authorization authentication. So that's, and that's one of the things I really wanted to get out from the, the summary also is, is start to, to, to create these good lists of uh, what are good playbooks. And, and we have a place to explore this because we actually have a JIRA uh, already uh, created for the summit. So if anybody wants to help to move some of these to, to that uh, environment and to see it in action, you know, please, please join in. Actually, any, any questions? There's a question on the sure. chat, so Tunis. Like oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so the one that, um, yeah, so again, the question is, is this available? Um, so the short answer is, is yes, because we want to share all this stuff. I think some of these might not be, have been moved to the, um, and I'll put the link on the chat to here, which is, um, um, which is where we, uh, where we have the, um, uh, where's the open, you know, security summit Jira. So, so yeah, I guess the question is we, we, we need a bit of help just to, to move this over there and, uh, and also to activate them. Yeah, we still haven't got there. Um, and these are all, um, based on OWASP's guidelines. So, um, that's where we got them from mainly. Yeah. Okay. So tomorrow when we, we talk about the incident response, the idea of the, the incident response of, you know, Petra, Sarah are going to run tomorrow is the same thing. You, you take a bunch of questions and you take a bunch of playbooks and you run them and then you see how you actually execute it. Cool. And, and then you have a defined process. Okay, so I've created a Wordly map about threat modeling. Um, I just wanted to explain it in a minute. Uh, basically, we have an application that requires, that needs risk assessment and a threat model. Almost as a commodity, we have the InfoSec team because in, in a lot of companies, it is already well-defined and created and common. Um, but then towards the left, we have the security champion and the threat modeling uh, the developer who will be at the you know pure genesis of the threat modeling who will create a unique rare threat model that will be only applicable to that certain application um and this is where it all kind of comes in so um yeah that's the worldly map well i think it's important any questions on this you can you can unmute yourself if you want you know Yes, please do. Like, if you want to interrupt me, if you want to discuss anything that I say or Dennis, just please feel to unmute yourself and say something and let's discuss it. <clears throat> well, actually, could you help us going through the Wardley map a little bit more in detail? Because I find it really interesting. But if you're going on, you're going forward now, we will miss a chance of reading it more deeply. 
Okay. Until can I stir a little bit more? Sure. So, um, on those who don't know about worldly maps, these are maps which help us create strategy. They're maps, not graphs. So position on the map is really important. So more towards the left hand side, we have something that is more rare and unique. And it's still in creation more towards the right. We have something that's more kind of stable and industrialized, like a repeatable process. And then you have up and down, you have on the value chain, something that is more towards up is something that's more visible. And then uh, towards the lower part, you have things that are not visible to the anchor. The anchor here is the application. So it's something that we will base this whole strategy about. So the anchor here is the application which has its needs. The needs are risk assessment and a threat model completed. And then we have the components that are lower, which we don't see, they're behind it. Um, and these components are either left or right, depending on how complex actually they are. Um, and in this case, as I said, the information security team in a lot of cases is just something that's already quite defined that, um, you know, it, it's, it's a stable uh, team that's present in a lot of companies. Um, while on the left hand side, we have more like the genesis of the threat model, which is actually initiated by the developer. But that's not visible, you know, at the application itself. It's something that happens in the background. So that's why the developer is lower on the uh, list. Not that it's less important, it's just because it's less visible. And this is actually the most important part because this is where the triggering of the threat model happens. So, this so you, is, you, you can think yeah. of this as a chain of needs. That's one of the ways yeah. that Simon talks about it. So you can see that the application needs, needs a, risk a risk assessment and a threat model. model. That's the need. To do the risk assessment, the threat model, you need an information security team. To, uh, the, the information security team needs uh, some security champions to, to facilitate the threat modeling uh, to work together. Uh, the security champions needs a developer, and, and the developer is then going to use uh, a playbook, right, from, from there, right? So the developer will need, in fact, you probably would want to link the security champion to the threat modeling too, um, because yeah. that's kind of used by both. And, and, and the thing that's very powerful on a map like this is that you, you, by just putting this down, we already have a very good visibility on the current almost assessment or expectations on the other side. So, so you, you can literally do this for your Korean company and depends on where the dots are, um, will depend on the maturity. So, um, for example, uh, the, and each of these could actually be uh, an individual thread model, right? So, so again, like you have to think about that. The, so an individual worldly map, sorry. The, the thing about worldly maps is that they, they can be changed, right? So we can, we can also zoom in on each of these to, to understand where we are. So what's interesting about, for example, this map, and, and you, if you look at the, the right now, the evolution from Genesis to custom build to product to commodity, that's sort of the evolution. That could also be non-existence to good or excellent, right? On that, that basically just one, one kind of move to the right tends to imply a more mature process. So this implies, for example, that you have a mature security team, right? So if your current information security team is not doing threat models, then that dot will be all the way to the left, yeah. right? And so I, ironically, I've seen cases, I was worse, actually worked on a company where actually the information security team was very MIA. They really didn't focus on threat models, but actually I was able to work with the security champions. So the security champion was actually a lot more mature and we were doing a lot of great threat models, even although the security team was actually not, you know, in a way almost helping, right? Because they were not driving the initiative. Right uh, in that particular case, in that case, you have a very immature uh, security team, uh, but you have a very mature development environment, right? Which actually, you know, at the bottom line, you still had a great threat model. But what 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 you get with this is you also understand where you are on this on the evolution. So in this case, I could also see that the risk assessment is not very mature, so we need to improve it. And that could be because it's still manual. It could be because we don't have a very good definition of it. It could be because we still have to, to, to scale, um, you know, for it, right? And, um, and, and that's what you do with this. So the thread model allows you to start to understand the landscape 
Um, and then, you know, so, worldly maps talks about climatic patterns, which are things that affect here, talks about doctrine, which is certain behaviors you can do. Um, but it's, it's a really great way to, to visualize uh, where you are and where you want to focus. So, for example, are we going to focus on the risk assessment to move it to the right? Are we going to focus on information security team? Are we going to focus on security champions, on developers, etc.? So in this case, you could see that we probably need to work a bit on the developer because we probably need to improve that a bit, or we maybe want to move the security champions a bit to the right so that that becomes a lot more of a, a productized uh, workflow. Yeah, that's a great explanation. So we have a cool question here. So mm -hmm. security champions should be part of InfoSec team or DevOps team, I guess any. Uh, wouldn't having someone from DevOps teams give better results. So, so my experience with security champions is that you want to have them everywhere, right? In fact, when we start, my, my, the definition I like to give is that if you have a heartbeat, right, and you work for the company, you qualify as a security champion, right? You know, it's very important that you literally go as wide as possible. So, yeah, ideally, you should have somebody from the DevOps team. You have somebody from the risk team. You have somebody from the development team. You have literally a great cross-function, almost like cross-cutting, you know, bit for the company, which representatives from everywhere. And, and ideally, the, the security champions are not part of the information security team. Now, I've seen cases where you want to fund that. So I've seen cases where, you know, we actually use some of the security team's budget to hire, for example, a developer that was placed on a team. And, you know, you had, you had to fix some stuff, but he's also become the security champion. Or you could also fund a developer that actually uh, or application security specialist that gets allocated to five or six or seven teams, and then he kind of becomes that, that player. But the best security champions comes from the teams, right? The best security champions is that individual on the team who's really passionate about security, who might want to come into security or, or, or finds it really interesting and can become your, your first point of contact in there. Cool, that was a really cool question. Um, yeah, security, cool. security champions are something that um, is proving quite useful. We started doing it recently and they had so much valuable input on every single process that we had. Um, so I would definitely advocate like to introduce something in your company if you haven't yet, because um, it, it gives so much value to the whole InfoSec process. Yeah, and the thing about this is you remember that you don't need an information security team to do this, right? You can do a threat model from a developer team, right? You know, threat modeling is fundamentally understanding the side effects of what your application is doing. So, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, I always find that it's very easy to look at these things and think, oh my God, it's massive and you need all these things. You know, you, you, always, you can always start with one point. If you can think in graphs, right? If you can think that what you're doing is creating nodes and edges and connections, you can literally start that everywhere and then you just follow the rabbit holes um, into where they take you. True. So, for some reason, oh, okay, there we go. Um, right, so to continue about threat modeling, I mentioned Stride earlier. So Stride is just also technically a set of attacks that you can think about. So you start with S is spoofing, you have T is tampering, R reputation, I information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privileges. Now, when you think about your application, you think about the strike questions because you, you need to cover all the possible attacks that could be a threat to your application itself. And every one of these has a set of you know, possible attacks that are quite common in this area. So for example, spoofing, you need to think about, is there a chance that the attacker can perform se session hijacking? Um, if you're thinking about tampering, then you have to think about cross-site scripting. Um, if you're thinking about repudiation, for example, you can think about audit log deletion. Information disclosure, you have to think about, can they perform path reversal? Um, in denial of service, you worry whether you you know, your website will be defaced. Um, elevation privileges, it can be done through buffer overflow. So you think about that. So these are some questions that you need to ask yourself in order to perform a threat model. And by asking these questions, you will actually cover 
uh, most you know, points of attack. So how do we do it? Well, it can be performed in steps. This is all based on an OWASP model, um, a guideline. So in step one, we, this is where the developer comes in. This is where it's important that the developer does it because the developer knows the application best. So the developer has to think about, you know, what is the application like? What is the profile of the application, the environment, for example, the libraries that will be included in the application, um, the users, the data elements, um, what permissions will these users have and what technologies will be used and also what security mechanisms apply. So you probably all know about the CIA triad of InfoSec. So that's confidentiality, integrity, availability. So you have to think about, are all of these elements covered? Like, is there a chance that someone by using your application can breach confidentiality? Can one user access another user's um, files, for example? Like, these are all questions that you need to ask yourself. And then Dennis will say about step two. <laughs> yeah, so, so if you look at, if, you know, what, when, you, when you think about a thread model, right, what, what you want to, to really sort of start focusing is on the, the user journeys. And, and if you go back to that sort of pen test on paper, right, you know, like when, when you're doing a pen test or doing a security review, what you're following is a path, right? You're following a path uh, from A to B. And, and one of the things that I found is very important in thread models is to really isolate the layers. Um, because if you don't, you're, you actually risk, you know, a gigantic explosion of thread model. And, and you also risk mixing a lot of context and you also mix, risk mixing a lot of audiences when you do a thread model. So, so the logic here is that if you do compose your application in, in, in the multiple kind of areas and you start to look at them um, on, um, on, on basically the, 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 the multiple components that are part of it and but also the, the sort of multiple context that you have um, that allows you to do thread models that are focused on each ones. So, so you can basically look at, for example, from the trust boundary, which is the cases where the trust level changes so you can look at, you know, how does the data flows from there? How does, so the, for example, the spoofing questions that you'll ask at that will probably be a little bit different when you're looking at things like the database and, and, and the integrity of the data there and, and, and who, do, who puts the data in there. And, and also like the, the connection between third party players and, and, and like the, the, the ports, let's say the, the, the one that's very interesting on this is when you actually look at the data flows because um, and actually GDPR was really interesting because we, we did some good stuff with GDPR and data models because GDPR also requires you to track the data to understand where your data is um, um, is, is actually operation so it's actually used and, and one of the great things to to focus on is the assets which is kind of connected to the data that you have because the best security model is that if you protect the assets then you can actually re, you know, remove a lot of complexity from your security. Because if you understand where your assets are and you can make sure that they are protected to a level that you're comfortable with, then you can have a lot of insecure parts of your application that almost don't matter because you, um, you've protected your assets or you have visibility in, in your assets. And, and those are key questions, for example, that you ask on your playbook, like where are your assets? Do you know where they are? Do you know what's your requirements to protect them? Do you know, you know how they get handled or where they get saved to disk, you know, where they get used on the application? Who actually consumes those? And, and that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you then pick up, right, when you do your threat models. So you, then we have a cool example here, right, just to, yeah, so this is one that we did a bit earlier last week. There's a video of it. And, and one of the things that's interesting is, so this is a, a very, and, and you can see it's very crude, but, but actually allows already a very interesting explanation of the process. So you can see that we, we had the, the, the stride on the left there, where we're thinking of spoofing, tampering, repudiation, first disclosed, disclosed denial of service, elevation of privilege, which actually I really like to think that, you know, when you, when you look at it, it kind of breaks, authentication, integrity, 
non-repudiation, confidentiality, availability, and authentication, authorization, sorry, authorization. And that's where you're trying to almost ask the questions. So if you look at this, this is a, one of the patterns of one of the things that we, we're trying to figure out how to do a glass wall effectively is that we, we have this service called filedrop.co.uk where you can drop malicious files and, and you get a clean file. So that's what we do, right? We take a file, we take a file, we build an object representation of the file, we break it apart, we sanitize and validate the files, and then we come up with a, a, a new one on the other side, created from scratch. So the interesting element here is that we, we do it over lambdas, uh, and the lambda actually calls the Glasswell engine who does this thing and then gives you back the clean file. The, the challenge with this is that um, you have a situation where, um, you know, what happens if there's a malicious file, which by the way, that's what we're handling it, that triggers an exploit on the Glasswell engine. And that means that you can either crash it which could be a problem, could leave it in a, you know, a denial of service state, which is basically, it, it, it feels okay, but it still, it doesn't do anything. Or um, it could actually trigger a buffer overflow, where in the worst case scenario, you jump out of the Lambda. That's what that little do red dudes are there. And then the problem, if you do that, it means that the next files that get processed can now all be compromised, not even just the first one that got compromised. So you start to see that it's very important to look at specific patterns. And also it's very important to, for example, have done a thread model on the Lambda function itself, because the Lambda function has certain properties that will affect the thread model. So if you don't understand the behavior of a Lambda function, it's impossible for you to do this thread model because you need to understand the difference between a cold start and a hot start of a Lambda function. You need to understand what happens when the Lambda fun function ends and then the next one starts, um, you know, while it's hot versus while it's cold. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so we have step three, Den, and this is the fun part where we basically identify the threats to the application. So we think about, you know, the, the, the previous step and then we cr create these threats. It's recommended that we use diagrams and attack trees because it just helps to visualize it all and it helps us think, you know, brainstorm um, all the possibly entry, exit points, data boundaries. We also have to always put ourselves in the attacker's position. Um, and then once we've done all of that, we create a threat list. So that would be basically a list of attacks, which would be uh, SQL injection, uh, cross-site scripting, um, eavesdropping, and so on. Um, and then we have finally number four, where we identify all the vulnerabilities and they should already, as I said, as we're doing it at the beginning in the design, so they should be factored to shape the design of the application itself. And then we can also create some tests for, um, for all the possible attacks that we found out and execute these tests to see how does our application hold in this scenario. And finally, once we've listed all the threats, we have all the vulnerabilities, we have to rank it. Um, based, and then once we have ranked these threats, we can present it to um, like a higher management and they will decide whether they want this risk to be accepted, mitigated, transferred or ignored. And this is why I said it's important that this is at the beginning so that we can act upon it straight away, not at the end, just before launch. And there's two methods for ranking. One is probability impact ranking, one is dread. Um, so probability impact is the one that I've done before. And for dread, I'll provide you a link further in the chat. Um, Sorry, Petra, just a yeah. small, small little comment. If you go back uh -huh. to that uh, um, list. Um, this one or the one before. Yeah, uh, an ignored risk is accepted. Yeah. So you can't ignore a risk. What you can do is you can, you can, um, um, uh, you have to accept it. But because then that has to be you, documented as well. Like it well, has to be Ignoring a risk is accepting a risk. So if you think about it, the process of accepting a risk is to, is to basically say, I'm okay with it, right? So in fact, may, maybe the thing can be actually, you know, mitigated, yeah. So you, got, you, you do something about it, transferred, it probably the, 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 I would add fixed there, right? 
um, that is the fourth one because that's the fourth state. So you can mitigate a risk, you try to reduce it, right? You can try to do mitigating, you know, have mitigating controls. You can transfer it where you can basically say, well, it's somebody else's responsibility. They, they should be the one doing it. Um, and then you actually have fixing, it, actually doing something about it, actually, you know, fixing the bug, fixing the thing, applying something else, et cetera, right? Because ignoring a risk is accepting a risk. Yeah. Okay. And the um, question here is, oh, can you help with the third step? So what do you mean by that? The, is it the risks or the two methods of ranking? Uh, was it this one? Oh yeah, that's the third step, yeah. What so the was question the... is, can you help out with the third step? Um, or we, we mean provide examples of that? This is on UDAY, CF010993. Can you expand a little bit? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Myself, Uday. Uh, just uh, can you explain the third step with the examples? This one? Yes, yes. That's correct. Yeah. This one. Okay. So um, I haven't put any attack tree examples, but you can see. So you know that, 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 yeah, that link I, was, I sent you early, the one from the cookbook. You want me to? Get it for you? Yeah, we will go through that. Actually, there will be examples. That's true. Uh, let's get to that. And then we'll, Dennis will explain some examples. Actually, that's a good idea. Sorry, I have to get back into the presentation now. Yeah, so we, we, the, the idea we're trying to do a bit later is just to do run a couple of examples, yeah. uh, which hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll answer that question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Dennis. That's, that's good. Sure. So, um, yeah, so basically when you think about threat modeling, you know, there's a couple of questions you need to ask yourself. So you need to always think about the OWASP top 10, even though it was 2017, they're still all very applicable. Um, you have to think about how safe is your API if, you, if you're dealing with an API, what protocols are using, where are there any exposed API keys in the code or anywhere else. You have to think about your data. Is it encrypted at rest or is it encrypted in transit too? Um, and as I said, you just have to think about like if you're an attacker, how would you get access to your application? Just, you know, these are a couple of questions that you need to be thinking about. Now, this is where um, Dennis will give you a couple of examples. Um, you can um, see it all in these links. And actually I will put these links into, um, I'll put these links into the chat too. And then Dennis can go through them. Maybe I, then Dennis can share his screen to go through it. Yeah, I can yeah, do okay. that. Yeah, yeah, if you put the links on the chat, then I can just take it from uh -huh. there. Yeah, give me a sec. Okay, so the links are all in the chat now. And everyone have a look at these links because we'll be using them in the next step. And Dennis will go through it now. Yeah, so let me start with, okay, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. <sighs> So you guys should be able to see my screen here. Cool. So this is a um, uh, this is a really cool project uh, that actually started at the, the last summit. Actually, this is a good example of a project that started a couple two summits ago, um, and he got a really good push at the last summit. And uh, and what he did is he published a number of really cool examples of attack trees and flow diagrams. So I'll, I'll show you. Um, what we mean by this and, and the, the power of these diagrams, by the way, is that they are all um, done in, in kind of dot language, uh, which is another way to scale. So, so the way this was done, I'll just pick one here, is they're done in, um, well, a lot of them are done in dot language. Um, uh, actually, some of them are done in Python, which is actually really cool. Um, yeah, so these actually are done in Python. So that is actually really cool. Um, so so the, the point of this is to, to do this um, these, these sort of um, environments. So these, design, so these diagrams in a way that you actually scale and you can actually you know, um, automate it. Um, which actually means that sometimes you don't control uh, the layout as much as you want it, but you then have in a way the scales. So you can see here that this is you know, the, 
the, the thread model or the analysis of, in this case, the flow diagrams of, of how an app actually works. So this app uses this, who calls this, who calls that, who then calls this, you know, who calls the multiple sequence of events. And, and eventually you really want to grab this from the source code. So you really want to uh, grab this from uh, a way that when the app changes, your diagram changes. Because you have to be very careful that if you don't do that, your threat model became become art, right? And they just become a piece of art that you created at the moment in time. And that's the fundamental problem I have with things like Visio and DrawIL and a lot of those is because fundamentally you end up spending a lot of time fighting or trying to make things look really nice and really structured, but then you lose the fact that, you know, everything needs to change. And in fact, in a really cool threat model, you should be applying a lot of, of this dynamically. So, um, so you can see here, right, you know, this is using, uh, again, dot language to, to create this and graph this to render it. So it's really cool, right? Because you can see that you can actually create nice and complex um, systems and, um, and, you know, and then you can have, you know, like this is a, even a secure checklist, but what's cool about it is you can start to um, understand the flow of events between the multiple systems um, in, in your environment. So you can see that this is, um, a th but this, is, this is like a thread model that in this case is sort of focused on how is the data flying and what is the, the connection between one system and the other. Then uh, the evolution of this is when you start to look at specific use cases and you kind of see how deep you go down the rabbit hole and, um, and, and how particular things work in practice. So here's an IoT device. Uh, in this case, look, there's a, a cool, like there you go, there's no authentication between you know, a particular system and, and the device. And, um, and actually, so, and these are the kind of things that you can do with a thread model um, because um, it's, it's, when, you, when you follow the rabbit holes, you, you sort of start to understand Right, you know, what you know, you ask the questions like who talked to who, and like, for example, in this case, oops, um, if you look at this, is that the user, right, you know, using a mobile app or a script to talk to their IoT devices that exist in their house, and then that sends data to the cloud, who then integrated in all different different places, and then you get the browser to see what's going on, right? So, there's there's a nice example, and in this particular case, you can see that, for example, the, the local device doesn't authenticate any of the calls. So, so that means that in this particular case, if you are in a local network, you most likely can inject stuff, can you send things to the device? And if you think this is theoretical, I remember a really cool hack that this guy did um, on, um, I think was the, the Nest or one of, the, one of the lamps, one of the first uh, lamps that, you know, like lights in your house that, um, were you know were on your local network so you could go to an app you could control and you dim your lights um, and then but what happened was because there was no authentication and they had a cross-site request forgery vulnerability actually meant that all you had to do is make a get request or a post request to the iot device and you can change it and then the iot device actually happened to tend to be in, in common ports and common ip addresses what this guy did was he created a website that you vi if you visit that website that will be sending the internal cross-site request forgery requests to the light. So it's actually pretty freaky because you go to this website and your light would dim in your house, right? So it's a, it's a good example of a problem of this, but it's, it's, you can see that, you know, um, you know, if you don't have authentication, you start to pick up these things, right? Actually on the medical one, I once found one on the <clears throat> uh, you know, insulin pump in, inside a person that was also connected to the, to a local app that there was no authentication. So you could actually re remotely start to change the settings on the isolin, the, the pump that was actually in somebody's body, which was not good, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, at that level. So yeah, so you guys get to see that, you know, this is basically a, a good way to see this. And, um, and, and actually, you know, a lot of the times it's okay to start like this, right? So you can see that you can start on pen and paper and then you evolve into something like this. Right, so, so it's, it's, this, is, this is a very fine way of doing it, right? And then you take that and you basically, you know, apply it to uh, the multiple things. So look, so these are all open source, you guys can use it. Some pretty cool examples on, uh, on here. So that's sort of uh, flow diagrams. The other thing that we've got here is also attack trees. <clears throat> and attack trees are a really cool way of thinking about this, where you start to map in kind of binary, you know, a tree model, 
what they want and so and what are you going to do to get it so you've got basically it's almost like i have a bunch of goals Please say that again. there's alexa see there's a bug in alexa right if you guys hear that right um there's still a number of keywords that when you speak trigger alexa which is actually a vulnerability right um not sure if you heard alexa but she just said something to me um um, so look, so you can see here, so the, the attack tree is basically uh, where the final number of goals that you want to achieve, and then you map to achieve this, I need to do that and that, and then that and that and that and that. So you get to see that, you know, if, in order if I want to get to my final goal, this one here, what else do I need to do, right? Or you can also do the reverse, start and then you expand on the, the thing. So look, so you can see here that if I want to steal cryptocurrency, what do I need to do? I need to gain access to a wallet. I need to con somebody. I need to gain exchange access. How do I do that? Well, I need API access. How do I do that? I need to do this, this, and this. Or, you know, in this case, gain wallet, gain access to local software, put some malware on it, get remote access, you know, and then, for example, and if I, if I have that one and that one, then I achieve this. So these are really cool because it, you know, and that's something that we can kind of work on now because we can basically say, you know, let's, let's create an attack tree for um, you know, some of the threat model examples that we have, or let's create uh, you know, the data flows into, into high works. So there you go, like that's the generic CMS, you know, still confidential data, online game, I want to win the game, and I grief the players, I want to gain fame. So you can see that the, the, even the motivations and the persona of the attackers gets very different. And actually there was a great session last week where we actually um, did a, a really cool thing, which was, um, uh, let, let me just quickly find that um, we, we've basically did uh, a number of sessions on uh, on persona um, and and then basically what what we had was um, these really cool cards yeah I can share it so um, so you guys so basically we did this and and this is something is already kind of open source and there's a really cool tool to do it and uh, and what you then have is um, this um, variations of creating your your kind of your players so you can see that define your attackers right so you know there's an opportunistic you know inside a threat and that's the tool that uses that's the methods that how it goes so we can basically create these characters right that basically determine in a way who are you against you know and then you map an attack tree on this and then you you get a nice sort of flow of, uh, of actually what, what is happening and how everything fits together. So it's, it's really cool, right, uh, to do this. And that's actually an online tool that, um, that you, you can actually you know, do, you know, do this, which is, which is actually quite, quite useful. So that's a, a cool way to do it because you then apply that to, to this. So it's very important that you also understand who is your attacker and who is actually you know, uh, you're focusing on. So, and Dennis, yeah. there's also three questions if you want to oh, cool. yeah. have a look. I can have um, a look. Actually, two questions. Yeah, so the, the tool uh, that was used for that diagram, uh, let me come back to you. I'll find that in a second. And the, yeah, the other one is, yeah, the, 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 yeah so the, this is the link to the main site. Yep. So this is the OS project. So from here, um you guys get and there's some really cool stuff on this right that uh, you should and you should i highly encourage you to participate right and that's where you go and actually there's the github repo that um you got right so you should go from there. the reason i show you that one is because uh actually and actually sent a pull request but they didn't accept it is that it does it doesn't have all the introductions right and i quite like to show them only one go or else i have to go to each one of these to see it and it doesn't it doesn't flow as nicely as where I was showing, but this is the this is the project right, and it's a really cool project right. You should um, highly encourage you guys to participate and to be involved. Um, the threat dragon is also in the links. That's a tool that you can use. Yep. I'm not sure if that was used um, for all yeah, of these. Yeah, no, that's a different tool. So that's a, okay. a really cool project um, that you've got. Let me just get it here and. Um, so, so this is a project from OWASP. Again, it's actually a client-side application now that you can, um, you can use it. And, um, and basically, you, you can install it from here. And, um, and it, it kind of allows you to run the, 
uh, no, sorry, not that one. Uh, no, sorry, clicked on the wrong link. Uh, Tread Dragon. Here we go. There you go. Yep. And um, and 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 what what you do with this? I was trying to find if there's a it calls cut screenshots with this. Is um, I have it installed in my uh, computer. Oh, cool. I can show yeah. it. Yeah, if you can show it. Yeah. Do you want to quickly show it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let cool. me put it up in a sec. One second. Yeah. So so this is that project. Actually, I was I was also going to show you guys, which is really cool. So this is a tool, a Python script that actually you can see allows you the one I was, I think you saw before where you can actually write your, um, um, your, pipe, your, your thread model in codes. And, and the reason why this is so important is because when you start to parse code automatically and you parse, for example, your Docker composed document or your Kubernetes deployment or your, your spring, you know, XML files or your, your Node.js structure, you, you, you know, once you do it programmatically, you need a tool like this to actually create the, um, um, you know, the things actually, you know, in, in a scalable way. Uh, so that, yeah, there you go. So, so you can see uh, that actually, and that, that outputs into a dot language, which is this. So it's pretty cool. Um, if, you, diagram. if you stop sharing, I can start. Yep. I can show the dragon. Cool. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah, so we basically have all the elements that you've seen on those. Um, this is an example that comes with the threat dragon, um, just so you can use it as like a template. Um, and, you know, it has all the elements that you had um, before that you've seen on these threat models. So you have the data boundary, uh, the trust boundaries, you have the data flows. You know, you have the actors, you have the processes, um, you have the stores. So it, it's it's all here, and then you can just you know use it to tweak it and to you can use it as a template to create a new one. So for example, here you can change it to um, I don't know SQL for example, um, and now see changed here, and then you can move it on the screen as well. So this is, you know, it's good to have a sample like this and then you can just move the arrows or delete elements and play around with this. It's a really cool and fun tool and it kind of makes the whole threat model in the end really clear. Um, so back to uh, the slide, there's also um, an, uh, the one that you used, Dennis, on the first link. I don't know if you want to show that one, um, the yep, one that you used for the cloud SDK. Um, that's probably the easiest one for uh, the participants to use now in the yeah so that that is a, a really cool one to use so um it's actually a, a one of the sort of online um you know probably draw your competitors you know tools which is actually quite a good one you know it's called visual paradigm online and um let me just share my screen mm -hmm. du, 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 and cool can you guys see my screen yeah you can so um so, so what this does, it already has a, a number of cool examples that you can, you know, you can play around with, you can take a look at it. And, um, and it's kind of the same thing. You've got, you know, you've got all the shapes and you've got the stuff here that you can use. And, um, and you got to get to see that it's kind of same, same kind of workflow. You can manipulate things, you can, um, you know, move things around, et cetera. And you got, you know, the different, you know, um, you know, areas and, and the things you're looking for, and then you can just create a new one. And that's the one I kind of use in one of the sessions where, you know, you can just start to move things around. And then, you know, this has that advantage that, you know, once you link things, you know, they, they follow you. And, and then this was actually quite a nice thing, you know, even from a trust boundary point of view, you can start to define, you know, where you are and, and, and what you're focusing on. So when we did the, the thread modeling for the COVID app, which is actually, you know, something I, um, actually, we might want to cover that in a bit because I think that maybe as another example, it's, it's actually a cool one to go through. Um, I can, you know, maybe walk you through the COVID app one. Um, uh, it's a, it was a really cool way to, to see that. And, and with the developers to ask, is this correct? Is this how it works? Is this how are you thinking? Or, and there, there was cases where we were going, well, okay, but you think that, you know, for example, that box is, um, is you know, you, you go from there to here. 
and, and this is how you're thinking. But, but the reality is, for example, there was a really cool example where we basically said, well, you think that, or you might think that the path goes from here, uh, sorry, um, goes from here to here, but the reality is that this is actually there, right? This is on a completely different trust boundary for that particular session. Although you might feel that is actually seen by, for example, this person here. So this is a good example that you might think, you know, I'm in this trust boundary, uh, the data goes from there to there. Actually, you might think it's here, but it's actually there. So for example, the data is sent to another place and then you consume the data from here. So actually more, more technically more correct, it was actually like this. You, you had, you know, the patient with the COVID data who's sending the data to a, a contact tracer and, and you only want, and this is quite confidential, that's quite confidential, but, but the actual data goes to the server before it gets there. So it was a, it was a good example of, um, of actually understanding better the flows and, uh, and then very quickly you, you get to the kind of the, the gist of the situation. Yeah, um, so the next step that we're going to do, um, if you allow me to share my screen again. Yep, Are you should be able to. Okay, cool. Um, so the next step that we're going to do is, sorry, I'm just going to share it again, is so that now that we've seen you've seen all the tools that you can use, but also if you feel like it's too much, you know, using these tools right now, you can just draw it on paper, like we said before. Um, but now we have a few challenges that we're gonna do, and we're gonna try and set you up in breakout rooms and try and get you to do these. Now we have a couple of scenarios. One was a very controversial one that we've, um, that was on the summit and that's, a threat modeling at password complexity with 2FA because uh, it raised a lot of discussions whether you know it's safer to have 2FA and then a weak password or is it safer just to have a complex password and no 2FA so that would be interesting also we have one about using lambda and azure functions to process malicious files so basically we're going to threat model lambda and azure functions um, the third one would be, um, it's based on an incident that we had recently, um, and it's, you know, whether API keys should be or should not be stored in a public GitHub repo. So let's th threat model that. What can happen if we do it, if we do store um, API keys in a, public, a publicly accessible GitHub repo? And, you know, how does this threat model come up during an incident, like, while we're actually doing it? And then the fourth one will be um, a Power BI scenario, which I'll come in a second. Um, and Simon, if he's still on the call, he can explain a little bit about um, this Power BI product that we're gonna threat model. Um, so basically, while trying to do these threat models, if you have any questions for developers or business owners, you can ask Dennis and me, and we'll try and answer all the questions to help you create this threat model. Now, um, Simon, are you still on the call? Yep, I just hit my unmute button. <laughs> Thank you. So if you just walk them through a little bit about this um, Power BI reports, and we started to the process of threat modeling them, but we haven't finished it. So this is a great opportunity because it's a you know real life example to try and do it completely. Yep, yep, no problem. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of bits on here that aren't a little bit out of date, but I can walk through the process. Uh, so in essence, what we're trying to do here is what a lot of people have done, which is to create a Power BI report um, that we can share internally uh, with as many people as possible. So we're using SQL as a source, uh, developing a Power BI report that's published to um, our own tenant in an app workspace. Um, and generally that's how people consume Power BI reports internally. Um, but to do that, you need a license. I'm not gonna go into the details of that. Um, but one of the things you can do is you can then decide to embed that content into an application, a website, um, and that enables you to then share that internally, externally, SharePoint on a website, on a mobile, pretty much wherever you like, um, but without the user, end user requirement a license. 
Um, so once you've done that, the bits that you can't see on here is that we've not used an Azure uh, function. Um, basically for the, for the work that's been done so far, we've used a static website hosted in Blob. Um, and that passes, uh, that part that re requires a token from Power BI embedded content. So that's obviously passing username passwords back to get the token. If the token's there and the user is authorized, then the content of the Power BI report will be displayed in that website. Cool. Thank you, Simon. So yeah. I, would, I would add that the other thing here is I also don't trust Power BI from a security point of view. Because the problem when, from this architecture is that the Power BI contains data from, you know, different customers. And, and we, you know, I kind of don't like the idea that if, even if Power BI had, you know, no vulnerabilities or, you know, or, or had, you know, uh, no kind of blind spots, it's, it's a good example of really complex application that is very easy to overshare things. And, 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 and from my point of view, I, I want to make sure that, no customer data gets exposed to, you know, customer A doesn't see data from customer B. So having this sort of Lambda function, having this, this middle layer that, you know, acts, you know, almost as a broker between the data sources, which is our RBI and what we create for the customer, uh, from my point of view, adds quite a lot of security. So it's, uh, I'm, uh, the license is a, it's a nice little thing, which is, um, you know, but, but I, I wouldn't say that's the main priority here. Uh, the main priority is make sure that you protect the data that exists in the SQL database that basically belongs to multiple users. Yeah, so the way to do that is to pass that user, D so you, you minimize it, you obviously can't remove it altogether, but if you pass the user credentials all the way back um, through Power BI, uh, it can either be handled in Power BI or directly in SQL, you pass that user all the way through um, to then only return the data that that user has got access to, but obviously no system's perfect, but yeah. We haven't implemented that for this at this stage because it's only for sharing internally, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be shared. Uh, in, in fact, I think there were some restrictions at the web end. So it's again, where, where are the threats and where do you want to, at well, what point do you minimize that, I guess? But we can talk about that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. So now the next step would be actually to uh, divide everyone in breakout rooms and see if we can come up with some cool threat models. Um, Dennis, can I leave it to you for the functionality of separating um, in breakout rooms? This is a question. Um, so how many breakout rooms do you want? And do you want it to be manually or automatic? Um, should we do, oh, you mean the threat modeling? No, the split. So I'm, I'm on, mm. I'm on, I'm on, um, um, uh, what's it called? Here in, in, uh, in, in Zoom, mm -hmm. I get, I can choose either I manually add everybody to a, a room or I can just go automatically and split everybody randomly. Um, should we just do it random to save some time? Um, or if like, you know, if someone has, does someone have like a preference? Now is the time to say it. <laughs> so, let's see. Okay, so how many rooms do you want? Uh, four rooms for each okay. threat model. Do we have a we have a moderator for each one of those? Who's going to do the fourth? Um, can we jump from rooms to rooms? Uh, Two of us. I can. I think. Let me just double check. Let me stop. Yeah. Sharing. Okay. So okay. So you're also co-host. So yeah, we could probably jump between one and the other. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's do four rooms. It's good. Right. All right. Here we go. Create our rooms. And, uh, and if you put Simon in the Power BI scenario, so he can help out with that. Okay, so let me rename this. So, so where's Simon? Uh, okay, so this is Power BI, Power BI room. Okay. Um, so we got the, um, the password complexity. 
complexity room. Actually, um, Vino, you're here, so actually you're on that one, since I think you participated <laughs> on that conversation. Yeah, but I may have to jump off at 12.30 like I have. That's true. All right. Yeah. So that's classic complexity. Then we got, actually, Petra, let me move you to, okay, so we got then API keys in GitHub repo. Yeah, if you put me there, actually. Cool. Okay, and GitHub repo. So I should have done this before. Um, and then uh, the last one is the Lambda function, right? Lambda Azure function. So I detonate. Uh, uh, cool. So I'll just move me into that one. Cool. All right. So, and um, give me a quick second. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, right. Cool. So, all rooms are open. So, you should now just click on join. All right, cool. So now after going to the breakout rooms, um, we get to um, uh, just go through what was created. I think everybody had a, a good time in the, the three rooms that were really active. And then um, there's actually some really good questions that were asked before by FP. So we'll, what, we'll, what we'll do is we'll go through the examples from each breakout room, and then you know, we'll answer those questions that FP asked. So who's, who's going to go first? Uh, Denise, I shared the, our uh, improvisation and I was thinking you will then share it with uh, all cool. the people. Yeah, it's there. Um, Petra, can you open up and share the screen? Yeah, sure. I'm going to do it now. You. Oh, there's nothing on the... No, link. actually, I, I think you might need to share... Um, a screenshot of that because I think that's the default unless you save it that big. Moment, I hope it. Uh, I the uh, moment, moment, moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will. Tatar, do you want to share your screen? Is she able to share her yeah, screen? Yeah, I think if you yes. stop, share. Yeah, yeah, Tatar, can you just share your screen? That's easiest. Yes, I'm doing it. Do you Thank see you. my screen? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, but the bet is that if you will tell me to draw something here, it will take ages, so <laughs> I'm new. Okay, do you see? Yes. Oh, uh -huh, perfect. So anyone wants to present it? Yes, so uh, actually team members who want to present uh, because there was one uh, colleague who was really very nicely uh, um, navigating me to add this square so can you please present or you want me uh, i could but i have a baby crying with me so it's gonna be tricky uh, so i can speak up and then you can add uh, the things that i um, forget Actually, I would say in the beginning, it was very stressful <laughs> when we were alone in the breakout, uh, breakout room, but then Petra helped out and uh, other team members did great job with uh, We decided to draw in this tool 
and uh, our task was to uh, define breeds for um, uh, when API keys get public. So we uh, got some breeds uh, and put it in the squares because there is, was no time to draw all the data flows. So we just uh, define um, uh, defined the uh, this. Uh, attacker, user, uh, players in that um, game, let us say. So there can be user who can have access to these API keys, there can be attacker who can get access, and then there can be even attacker that can access the user in that, um, through that uh, uh, public APIs. Um, so uh, the freeze that we identified for user and also for attacker was that uh, um, pro products can be used exter externally without permission, uh, which uh, also we uh, just, um, this could bring some other risks that for example, there can be performance issues, there can be denial of service because of lim limitations of the request. Uh, and uh, then the product can be easily hacked because APIs are publicly available. Um, I, I, other risk we see that when you have product APIs available, then why to buy this product? Yes, any case it is available, then you can go and use it without paying for it. Um, this one, uh, um, uh, then uh, using API keys, you can easily then edit the code or uh, write malicious uh, code or then uh, impersonate another legitimate application. Or even with APIs, you can access another products, not even this one, but also can use it to access other products. Um, yes, there can be data expo exposure, which will bring uh, a lot of uh, like uh, then uh, headaches with GDPR that username, password can become public and so on. Then uh, you can even get reputational damage. So the code, I don't, re I don't remember that I wrote it, but uh, no, okay. Yeah, that, that was unfinished, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we didn't finish. We, you were patiently writing it. So, and then there was this trusted boundaries. There can be internet and backend database that API will be connecting to the database. You need to have some mm, um, configuration there and you need to use internet for that. So this is uh, what we come up. So everyone is free to make our model the nicest possible. So, Denise, Petra, please comment, or it was so good that you don't have any comments. <laughs> no, nah, really cool. And, you know, remember that threat modeling, like maps, right? They're, they're a way to start to communicate, right? You know, like once you start thinking about these things, right, it's, it becomes easier to know what you're defending and what angles, um, you know, to do, right, on this. And it kind of all starts by one scenario. You know, if the API keys are available, what's the side effect of this? And uh, so one thing that would be nice to map here is the assets. So what, what are the assets that exist in that environment? Because that, then you know what you kind of need to protect. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, yeah, there you go. So if you, if you list the assets, um, in there, then you know, for example, how bad some of those things are, right? So when you talk about, let's say, GDPR, um, and you talk about, like, this is the data that exists in the system. So you want to understand, you know, do you have customer data? Do you have employee data? Do you have sensitive data? That's usually one of the first things that you want to, to, to look for. Yeah, actually, there was these questions that we didn't um, write down. We were um, discussing it during the session that uh, what kind of APIs we are talking about. Are there sensitive data? Uh, how, you know, what kind of access you will get, uh, give with these uh, public APIs, only read or also write access? Yeah, absolutely. So you can see that when you have those playbooks, right, is those questions are really important. Yeah, you have yeah. an API key that is exposed to read-only data, it's very different to read write. And um, 
and, and actually, you know, the, 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 the number of assets that you have in there and the type of assets that you have in there will determine how much damage, you know, how many of these you actually have to care about, how many you don't have to care about. Yeah, I think I think it's really cool. You covered a lot of attacks here, and um, yeah, the data flows. Um, you know, once you cover all the attacks and put all the assets and threats there, the data flows actually just come naturally, and you just some connect the dots, and and suddenly it all starts making sense. So I think you you almost had everything here. Thank you. Should we go to the next one? Um, should we? Uh, covered the password bi uh, sorry the not password bi the password um the password one uh do we have a volunteer to present yeah yeah hi petra and hi Dennis. hi mm, yeah uh, so this is from the team of password complexity so like due to the time constraint so and it was a first experience as well so we have just used pen and paper to just make a note of it so I hope I can uh, just uh, tell it as such, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you just say and um, you can share, you can possibly, um, mm -hmm. you could possibly like show your map on the video. Can you, um, yeah. I actually, yeah, you can do it on the video if you want. Or you okay. take a screenshot uh, and just write a tweet. Oh, something. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fine because actually it's not a kind of map. So we have just uh, jotted down. So like mm -hmm, what could mm -hmm. be the common threats? So what could be the common threats and how it could be mitigated? So these were the only two things that we could do it because like, uh, so we were held up with only uh, two people in our team and uh, Anandan had to just jump to an emergency meeting. So that's why. So I'll just uh, take a screenshot of it and then I'll just uh, tweet it as well. Cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe while you're doing that, yeah. uh, should we do the Power BI just for, um, yeah. Yeah. and then you okay. can in the meantime, uh, you know, tweet it and we'll find it. And then, yeah, just, yeah. just drop, drop the link to the tweet on the chat and then we can. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Cool. All right. Yeah. So let's see the Power BI. One second. Let me share my screen. We, we talked, um, we started off with a bit of a basic what it, what it is and I went over the um, I went over the process in a bit more detail and then we started to try and map how um, should be there um, yeah no when I request token no I'll get rid of that yeah we then started to map out in terms of the data flow I, I guess where we got stuck is then trying to tag things as assets and um, what happened. So we probably got a lot of data flow and a lot of process in there, but probably not a lot of the security elements, but I suppose it at least highlights where attacks could happen. Um, do you want me to talk through it? Yes, please. Yep. Okay. Um, so from, I suppose if we work the opposite end of the data where the user comes in, the user will come in to um, an Azure blob static website. Um, and that website in this case has an iframe. So in terms of what security exists at the moment, obviously that's the user coming in. Um, at the moment that's in, we've got firewall and firewall rules and other aspects there to stop users getting in because this is probably the, well, I see it as the weakest point, but we can discuss that. What that will do is that will then request or make sure that the um, the service principle is authenticated in Azure AD or in Azure AD app. Um, if that happens, point one, then point two, it will go off to Power BI and request an access token based on those credentials. Um, if that token comes back, it will pass that token through to request a report, um, which should be number three, but we seem to have lost. No, we seem to have lost number three. And then if all of that happens, the report will be returned to the iframe. Um, there is a process that happens over here, um, but in the terms of the report that we're looking at, the data and the report structure is actually all stored in here. Um, so there's a process to refresh that and publish it, which we've shown on here, um, but the user here doesn't have 
direct access through to here. So they can only, in this example, um, because you can, you can have this talk directly to this, but in this case, the, the we've, we've limited the data that's been published. So the user would only ever be able to get back to here unless they, of course, attacked directly here. But that's where we got to. What we, I guess we're at the same point as the others in terms of listing out the assets and these bits, which is where we kind of got a bit stuck. Yeah, but that, the other thing that's really cool with this is you, you also want to start drawing the multiple um, uh, trust boundaries. And um, in fact, in one of them, you already have, you can see you already got two trust boundaries there because you got, forgive, even on the Azure Blob website, you got one, which is the website, and the other one is the iframe. <clears throat> And the iframe is actually a different trust boundary than even the main website. Um, and um, so it's important to start to distinguish the, the different access, right? That you, you got and the different, you know, like who has access to what, which is, okay. which is, which is really cool. Yeah, and then the assets is where you start to list what assets exist on, on what, what parts. So you got, you know, not just the data, but you're gonna have tokens, right? Left, right, and center that yeah. are flying here. So each of those becomes an asset that you want to start looking at. And what's really cool about this is this is now at a state where you can literally just put the, the kind of the spoofing, the, the sort of the stride, you know, thing next to it and like just start asking the questions about spoofing, which is, you know, authentication or the information, you know, tampering, information disclosure, denial of service, all that jazz, right? Yep, yep. So an interesting case, for example, here is because you don't have the Power BI going directly to Azure SQL database, right? From the denial of service, the worst case scenario seems that is the reporting that gets off, not the main thing, right? But if you had the Power BI service dedicated capacity, that guy going all the way to the database, then there's a possibility that you could actually affect the main SQL database with, for example, lots of traffic or, or you know, a kind of a, a very expensive queries. Yes, yeah. Yeah, there are scenarios where you can do that, but for this scenario, um, it doesn't. And, and what, so this is actually a very powerful point, right? It's super important to actually capture the thread models throughout the history of your project, because this is a perfect example of um, a project that might start like this, but then as you get closer to the dates, can you draw a line from the Power BI to the Azure database? And then as you get closer to the date, what ends up happening is exactly this. You know, just the line. So it should be able yeah, to- Yeah, I'm trying. It doesn't like lines in, yeah. in, you've got that one. Yeah, so what ended up happening, probably the other way around um, from, yeah, but I would put it the other way around. But so, so what ends up happening is something like this. So where, yeah, so, um, you know, because of a, a particular business request and because of a particular, requirements and because it's possible you know it's all within you know the same control of sometimes the dev teams or that you know, they actually make that connection for a couple of you know that's not real time that's reality <laughs> wow yeah yeah so so it's very important so so if you look at this this is a perfect example of when you add that line that you just added the threat you have to revisit the thread model Right, and this is what I mean by locking the brief and making sure that we understand the security implication of a change, because that might feel like a small change in the scheme of things, but that introduces a huge amount of threats that before you probably didn't have to care about. And it's, it's very realistic to sometimes have to do this because maybe in this case, the data was impossible and, and there wasn't enough time to make the changes to the Power BI desktop or make changes to that workflow. So you end up going straight away to the SQL database. Cool. Oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. This was uh, really cool. Um, I really like your data um, flow diagram. So um, are we also ready to see the, um, the password complexity one? Or is there any further questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Okay. I'll All just right. share the screen. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm just... Uh... 
yeah i've just uh, made a rough sketch so i'm sorry like if it's not right e yeah i hope it's visible yeah it is uh, right yeah uh, so just like with respect to password complexity what we thought is we just uh, started up with what are the common threats that might hinder the uh, passwords to be set so one threat could be the default password attack so wherein like if the passwords are not changed so that is a uh, attack and the brute force which is a permutation and combination attack and brute force with mask is wherein i know few characters of the passwords and uh, the other uh, characters of the passwords is uh, again a mere permutation and combination and the other is a dictionary attack so with the help of a dictionary list wherein the attacker can actually create the dictionary list and launch the attack and the other one uh, the other common threat so which is with respect to password is storing of passwords so wherein the passwords could be uh, stored either like with the help of a sticky note wherein it is publicly visible to everyone so these are the uh, common threats so that might come up with and uh, we just thought of what could be the authentication uh, methods or a few kinds of uh, methods so wherein we could make the passwords with uh, a complex so one is to use a two factor authentication or multi factor authentication so that a passwords could be uh, complex uh, could be enhanced a bit so the other one is storing of passwords so so if people feel that no i uh, want to store a password in a secure area wherein i can get an a uh, paper kind so they can use one a very simple technique is a lock box so wherein they can just uh, lock the box even that is still again a uh, a uh, controversy in that or they can use a hardware hardware based authentication wherein they can store their passwords in a ubiquity so this were the things so that we just jotted down with respect to password uh, complexity they can use a sticky note Sorry. <laughs> they can use a post-it note, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, a post-it note. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. So, so the interesting question here, right, which is really cool, right, is yeah. that if you go to go up a little bit, right, and you mm -hmm. see you got the, the four password attack, brute force attack, with mask and dictionary attack, how many mm -hmm. of them are mitigated with two FA? Okay. Um... Okay, uh, the default uh, password attack would be uh, mitigated if I'm not wrong, and the dictionary attack would be mitigated, and the brute force attack, yeah, uh, uh, the brute force as well as dictionary attack, if I'm not wrong, would be uh, mitigated. Yep. Yeah, that's correct. You mitigate a lot of attacks by introducing two FA. Okay, right. Good, great. Then. <laughs> See, so, so yeah, so so the idea here, right, mm -hmm. is that once once you introduce two FA, mm -hmm. right, a lot of those threats go away. Right, right, yeah. Now you you might have a new threat, which is blind spots in your two FA system, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. but I, I would argue that the risk of that is is lower, but also. If there's a problem, you can always just fix it once, and it, it you know affects everybody, right? Oh, true, true, yeah. Where when you have you know with, if you have users with insecure passwords, you know you it's like a whack a mole, right? It doesn't you know if you even fix for five users, you can have another twenty that have weak passwords, right? And um, right, right. And um, yeah, the other one I would just add on the threads. I know maybe I know if you have that. Which what's the brute force with mask? What is that? Mm, okay. Uh, brute force's mask is wherein I know like a few characters of the passwords, so I just enter those characters. Whereas the remaining characters uh, would again go ahead with the brute force met methodology. Ah, I got uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think actually it's more realistic today. It's almost like brute force with leak passwords. Exactly. Yes. You know what I mean, so the idea would be that if I if I go and get one of those big password dumps, mm -hmm. um, then you know I can use that. To to try just a couple of passwords, and that's very hard to detect against. In fact, it's very hard; it's almost impossible to deal with, um, because oh, okay, it's possible, but it's very hard because the attackers only have to try a couple of passwords. They just have basically because they already have a list, so they're just using for password reuse. Right, right, yeah. 
but what's cool about it is to, so in a way what you want to do is yeah. almost like two thread models here. So you want to do the thread model with 2FA and the thread okay. modeling without 2FA. So you can see them side by side. Sure, thank you. Yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll stop Good. Just, just share that, can you share that document? Just, can you just save it and put it on the, the channel? Yeah. I think we can grab it from there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Cool. Okay, so shall we go to um, answer the few questions, yes. uh, Dennis, and we can conclude the session. Yep. So FP, you, you asked some really cool questions, right? Which is basically, um, so the question is, in finding hard to understand the starting point of the threat model. And you say, assuming the first stage, you don't use any tools to automate the process, you're simply using a whiteboard, right? So, so the question is, you as a security engineer call everybody in the same room, dev, DevOps, product owners, and start asking the questions, or you start alone, understand the maximum you can, and then create multiple rooms to the different teams to improve your model. So I would actually, it's a mix, right? So I, I would say that when, when, I, when I would do a thread model, I'm starting from scratch. I would actually do a little bit of a homework. Um, ideally try to use the system that you, you, you're testing it or, or and ideally even taking a look at the code so that, uh, and even reading the information that they have, right? So I'll probably say that the first step is to just ask the question, you know, uh, give me links to everything you've got right which is actually a, a good thing to do anyway because the, the worst thing you can do is be in a session and they say well and they reply to you and go well you, we got this we got this we got that right so so if you're doing a threat model the, the first kind of party trick is to say give me everything you've got which also already gives you a very good indication of how much they understand and how much mature the steps is on the other side right so um once and, and then when then once you got that you know digest that information and ideally what you want is to have a couple, of, a couple of targets that you can base the thread modeling on. So for example, like I would always try to find maybe a couple of security vulnerabilities or a couple of situations that I know there were blind spots that I could identify before. So that when I, when I you know, um, did the thread model, especially if it's a team that never done it before, you can score a nice couple of easy wins not easy, but you know, a couple of like, get them really excited about, wow, this is really cool because, you know, I'm seeing something I haven't seen before. Does that make sense? No, FP, if you can. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. But, but also look, I, I look, I, I, you know, for a while I was, you know, security consultant, right? I was literally be dragged to a room where I had no idea what it is. Right. Right. And sometimes, you know, uh, you just smile and nod for the first half an hour. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and you just digest it and then you just start to apply all those questions of, you know, uh, how it works and the spoofing and authorization, et cetera. And, um, but getting somebody to draw the end to end is really powerful. Um, especially when they don't have it already. Right. And, um, and I've done sessions where you start with five people in the room or three people in the room, and then they realize that they don't know something. So they call somebody else and they call somebody else. I remember once where there was like 20 people in the room by the time we finished because they, everybody was like realizing that when they provide a piece of the puzzle, they're also going, oh, shit, sure, this is how it works, right? So they got really interested because none of them had a good end-to-end -end understanding of how everything works. But so, you know, but, but I would say that, you know, most teams these days will have some architecture diagrams, will have some good structure, right? Especially, you know, systems that are more real world, they, there's always a, a, a couple of good architects so it's, it's unlikely that in the beginning, right? Like there's a lot of good thinking, right? So for example, if you look at the stuff that Simon was presenting, there's already a lot of great thinking on it. So you want to leverage that. But the more you know about it beforehand, the, the better it is, right? The more you can steer it to, a, to kind of a point where you can go, well, if these three dots connect, well, then that's a problem, right? So- Yep, makes sense, thanks. Cool. So the second one is assuming you're threat modeling a user application with lots of dependencies. Do you start by a high level threat model or you pick a specific journey? I actually think you do both, right? So I think it's on, on every app is important to have the meta picture. Like what are we doing here? Like what's happening? And that's like boxes, like big level boxes. Um, you know, you go from here, you go from there, you go from there. Um, but actually what, what I like to do is actually jump a couple of layers and, and then go into use cases. 
because if you try to sometimes, like we said, on big applications, if you try to expand from the top down, it can get super massive very quickly. Um, so I think sometimes it's important that you get a first view of everything, right? And, you, and, and, and that first view is basically just giving a pen and paper or to somebody who understands the system and start mapping everything. And then it's important to pick on a specific use cases. In fact, it's very important at that moment in time to ask them, what do you care about? Right, so, and then you, you, you measure the posts. Are they care about data leakage? Are they caring about tampering of data? Are they caring about unauthorized actions? Are they caring about, you know, secrets that they might have about customer data? So, so then, you know, I would then do use cases around those scenarios. Because again, it's about finding places where you add a lot of value to the team uh, as much as possible. And um, cool, so last one. Yeah, you can, you can zoom in on specific, so questions a few times you mentioned, you can zoom in on specific process. How do you do this? Um, does it mean you have a high level threat model and then multiple small threat models? Yeah, that's exactly what it means, right? Yeah, okay. I thought there would be some sort of uh, application that allows you to click on the process and that, that will expand and, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's, okay. that's the one that we're all waiting for somebody to develop. Um, to be honest, the only place I've seen that working very effectively, and, and that's something that we're trying to do at Glasswall, and we, 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 have, we will try to share all of it as we do it, is uh, I was working with these guys, and, and, and we actually were using it. It's a graph. So for every app that we were doing, we actually were creating, um, what's it called, um, a, a, a mini graph for that application. In fact, at, at Protobox, at the end, you know, there was a really cool thing that because we were putting everything in Jira, we actually got to the point where we could start a thread model by you know, just looking at the relationships that we already have in the, in the database in a way, and then you, you take it from there. So, so what you need, basically you need a graph database where you, so you, and you need two things to store. You need to store a, a series of nodes and edges, relationships, for example, this system called that system called that system called that system. And this is very powerful because sometimes you, understand, you realize that the, the API developers don't know even internally who calls their system and they don't understand how their system is actually used. So, you know, and it's very powerful to, for example, say, oh, okay, we have a problem with the credit card processor, show me everything that hits here, right? Or we have a problem with, you know, this particular service, show me every service that actually is calling this. But then what you need is you need to have another diagram, another ticket. We use, I think we call it flow tickets or thread, actually, I think we call it thread model flows. And, uh, and that's a, a ticket that almost, owns, you know, contains like a dot diagram which basically says this system on this journey, this system calls that one, calls that one, calls that one. And that's very important because it just, it just covers one journey. Because if you don't do that, you realize that the systems, you know, especially on the complex systems, they'll be calling all sorts of things, right? And yeah, exactly. it's not because the authorization service, or let's say the customer service can talk to 20 other services that in that particular flow, those calls occur. And, and that, yeah, that's kind of how you scale, right? So you create multi-layers of threat models and then, you know, ideally you can then visualize them all in one go, but that tends to be quite messy. Um, but, but it's very powerful to be able to say, you know, on this node, what are the journeys that affect me and how does this fit into the bigger picture? Yeah, fair enough. Thanks, that, that was really cool. Really good. Uh, uh, look, a, good, a good example is for example, like you want to do a thread model where we just look at data at rest. So you want to do a mapping and saying, where is all the data stored and how are they storing it? And what's the status of all the data and all the secrets that we have? And then um, in a way, every one of those systems affected, you will inherit those threats with any, um, what's it called? Any, any journey that touches those systems. Right, because if you have a system that's persisting all their logs or, or their logs are enabled and it stores all the data, then you know that that system is basically leaking data or storing, storing data that contains secrets. So if you have another, another flow that go, the data goes through that system, then you have to expect that your data is now stored somewhere on a server or somewhere in Kibana or somewhere in, in, a, in a log stash somewhere that you know, could now contain confidential data. Yeah, can I, can I take the opportunity to just to ask you another quick question? Sure. Um, so I've seen other presentations from you where you pretty much store everything on Jira and, and that is great. Uh, so uh, 
do you you pretty much create a ticket for everything but um regarding parsing that information uh so to make it um useful for the business and for your team uh, i'm not i'm assuming that you not just try like jql to to find what you want do, do you oh, use no, the no, jira api yeah 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 jira sucks to get data out, to to visualize data it's like yeah exactly so yeah. How do you visualize that Katvik, um did and dario last week uh, Tatve, can you just quickly put up the slides? See, this is a good example where I should be able to go to the Open Security Summit website and get your slides, but I'm not sure that's there <laughs> already. Do you have the slides for the session on Friday? Yes, Dennis, I have, but now I have someone here crying. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, Dario, do you have them? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I have, been, I have been in Google Slides, one moment. Yeah. So yeah, so we, we did a session. So, so what we do, right, is um, uh, we, uh, we, we take all the data from Jira, we pump it to Elasticsearch, and, uh, and then we actually use, so we have a Slack bot, which is the code is all open source, where you can create all sorts of diagrams. And also we use Jupyter Notebooks to create visualizations of that. Oh, okay. So you put everything to an external, yeah. yeah. Okay. Elasticsearch. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That's yeah and you don't okay. query Jira, right? Because Jira is too insanely slow to query. Yeah. I was doing this time. It gets very, very messy. Um, yeah, so yeah. 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 yeah thanks and, for that. And, and the other problem with Jira is that um, it doesn't, um, you know, which is, I, I, this is actually super ironic, right? So we use Jira as a graph database, but, but Jira is not very good as a graph database, right? Which is, which is kind of why um, what, what we do is we, you know, we, we pump the data from, um, from Jira into Elasticsearch and then, um, and then Elasticsearch is, that is super powerful to, um, to process the data. So, uh, Denise, do you see my screen? Uh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. Um, these are slides from uh, Friday, but I was also showing uh, uh, Ruben's slides on um, how he was mapping, uh, uh, doing reports and so on. But here is the project schemes that we were making. So, so each of these yellow boxes, right, is a Jira ticket. So, so what you see here, is a visualization of, um, of, of the Jira tickets. And you can actually see that the project has features who then have stories, who then have tasks. And, um, and each of these is a Jira ticket that we then use to, to scale out. See? And then, and then there's yeah. also really cool visualizations that we do, for example, you know, so, so, and also, but by the way, I think Jira without this kind of technology is insane to, to manage, right? Because you, you either overlink or underlink stuff, right? This allows you to understand the links, allows you to fix problems, allows you to see all sorts of gaps that you have, right? And, um, and then, and, and then when, once this becomes too big, if you show the next table, then we're using Jupyter Notebooks, right? Which is got here to actually process a lot of this. So this is actually that same structure, but you can see on a nice stable flow. So, so I've done similar for this for risks and vulnerabilities where you, you aggregate things and then you can start to consume them in a really uh, easy to process way. Okay, and how to do these or how to get uh, these One. maps? It can be found on the Friday presentation, right? Yeah, so take a look at that, but I, that, that might yeah, be something okay. that's worthwhile doing another session, right? So if you want, you know, you know maybe, you know, because Dario and Ruben, who are, you know, I, I'm not sure Ruben is here, but Dario from the team um, has developed a lot of these, right? And, 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 and I'm more than happy to, to share all that stuff, right? And, and the, the key of this is to, um, yeah, is just to set up that environment where you, um, you take the data from Jira, you pump it into Elasticsearch, and then you consume it from, Jupyter Notebooks or from Slackbot. And all that code is on a project called OSBot, which is the um, uh, OWASP security bot. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Cool. Right, Thanks, Tatvix. <laughs> okay. Up. 
Well, thank you everyone for participating and for showing your um, great um, threat models. I'm just going to share my screen um, as... I will just thank you just uh, to show Ruben presentation here uh, because he was having this uh, Jira and Jupiter more. Oh, like okay, cool. Visualization is done and um, also uh, easily organized into pandas and so on. This all the guys can show like if needed in another session, just, uh, yeah. yeah. And cool. w both how you can access that. So if interesting, we can organize some uh, demo that is not a problem. I just cool. And let, let's oh, make sure we put this <laughs> on the, um, the, open, the, the security summit session, because that's where I was going to go to find it. So we can actually publish these Google Docs in it. So I'll give you slides on it. So, mm -hmm. Sure. Cool. Thank you. All right, Petra. OK, I will just uh, share my screen now. And uh, one second. Yeah, so. Um, I'm, this presentation is going to be publicly available. So these are some links to, um, you know, to kind of investigate more about threat modeling. Um, you know, I advise you to go back to OWASP top 10 to remind yourself of that. Uh, OWASP has some secure coding practices and guidelines and checklists that you can help your developers with um, on, you know, to potentially fix some of the threats. And, you know, you can always go to the CV Meet our website to check out new vulnerabilities. Um, and that's it. These are the references. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. You did all brilliantly. I'm really happy how this turned out. And uh, if there's any additional questions, say now or stay quiet forever. No, I'm joking. <laughs> thank you. Cool. Ending recording.